We're in Volterra, which is one of the most attractive of all the Tuscan walled towns. It's amazingly preserved. Uh, the town is about a thousand years old and the buildings we see today easily date back to the Middle Ages. And the earliest foundations of Volterra go back to the Etruscan days, nearly 3,000 years ago. There was an Etruscan town here and it was one of the main dozen Etruscan towns in what is today Tuscany. And eventually it was conquered by ancient Rome. Uh, that was about 300 BC. And the Romans ruled for that era until about 500 AD. And then comes the Middle Ages. And later, occupation by Florence. Back in the Middle Ages and the early Renaissance, 1400s, there was a lot of rivalry between these city-states. And Volterra was actually an uh, autonomous city-state. It has a marvelous wall around it, which is beautifully preserved today. It goes for about three miles all around the city, preserving the stone historical gem intact. It's mostly a pedestrian zone when you're in the old town. The residents uh, live in the old town and they uh, work here. It's a great tourist center, and yet it's a little bit off the beaten track of tourists. You can't get here by train. You can get here by bus, so it's, uh, for example, about a two hour bus ride away from Florence. Uh, direct buses, maybe five times a day. So it's certainly feasible if you were staying in Florence for a couple of days or in Siena, you can get over to Volterra and you would really be delighted to see how beautiful this town is. And of course, there's a whole bunch of restaurants, there's pizzerias, snack shops, coffee shops, lots of little stores. One of their specialties here is alabaster. And earlier, uh, they had a lot of alabaster mines, which are actually still in operation today. And the shops sell this very fine, thin white stone alabaster come they make plates out of it and bowls and lampshades little figurines earlier in the history of Altera uh, a different mineral was important it was alum a-l-u-m alum and that was used for setting the dye in textiles that was very important in Florence which was a great textile center and one of the reasons why Florence under the Medici wanted to control Volterra and so they did, they conquered it. Lorenzo the Magnificent sent the Duke of Urbino over here with his troops and massacred some civilians in Volterra and subdued them and then paid them a little pittance as a reward to keep them in line. And for several hundred years, Florence dominated Volterra. There's a handful of very charming small hotels within the walls of Volterra in the old town uh, we're staying at one called La Locanda. It's quite nice. And there's three or four other significant hotels and then some tiny ones and some bed and breakfast, pensiones. So you can find places to stay. If you're here during the busy season, of course, you will want to be sure to make reservations. We're here in the off season. It's November, which is really a lovely time to be traveling in Italy. Temperatures are nice and there's very few tourists around. Most attractions are open, some are closed, some restaurants are closed, and attractions do have somewhat limited hours. But November is wonderful to be here. The availability of hotel rooms is no problem. You can get a table in a good restaurant without worrying, and you don't see many crowds. You have the town all to yourself, shared with the locals. Volterra, put that on your map. We are visiting the ancient medieval town of Volterra in Tuscany, central Italy. We're spending a few days here, really enjoying the sights of this old stone town. We'll be taking a look at Volterra with a local guide, Annie, who is quite famous in the area as one of the premier local tour guides in Volterra. And Annie is going to be showing us the town. 
Uh, Volterra is Tuscany's oldest continuously inhabited town. Uh, that's why it's such a great place for, uh, for history lovers, but it's also, um, it's also a town that has a very vibrant local community. It's not a big town, it's not a big city, it's more than a village, but it's just, it's got so much going for it today as it did in past centuries. Volterra has been inhabited since at least 1500 BC. That's time when uh, central Italy was inhabited by a people called the Villanovans. Um, later, in the 8th century BC, they would be more or less replaced by the slightly more famous Etruscans. Now, the Etruscans and Tuscans are not, it's not the same thing, but Tuscany does get its name from these ancient inhabitants of the region. They were pre-Romans, uh, although they do kind of develop together with Rome, but they're doing some of the world's most magnificent gold jewelry, not to mention many other cultural productions at a time when Romulus and Remus were basically being suckled by the she-wolf on the banks of the Tiber River. And Volterra would become one of the, uh, one of the 12 Etruscan city-states and one of the most powerful and populous of them. By the fourth century BC, Etruscan Volterra counted a, a population of about 20,000 people, which is astonishing. I mean, it's larger than Rome for almost a century. And it also means that Volterra and the Etruscan period had a lot more people in it than it does today. So today we're officially 12,000 people, um, but that counts people like me who live in the countryside. Whereas in centuries past, they'd only count the people living inside the city walls, what would make Volterra today five to 6,000 compared to 20,000 back in the fourth century BC. This piazza, that we're in, Voltaire's main square, is called Piazza dei Priori. It has been the center of civic life since as long as anyone can remember. The oldest building in the square is the Tower of the Piglet, La Torre del Porcellino. We don't know exactly when it was built, but we know when it was constructed. It was originally used as a residence for uh, a private noble family, uh, like so many of the house towers uh, built in Tuscan towns uh, in that period, so San Gimignano, Volterra, Florence, Pisa, they all had house towers such as this. Um, what we do know is that in 1226, halfway through the construction of the town hall building, the Palazzo dei Priori, uh, the town government was so fed up with waiting for the construction to finish that they bought the tower from the family that had previously owned it. And it's in that tower that they would hold their government meetings until, of course, their, their palace was completed. Now, it's a mystery to us as to why there's a piglet up there. Historians have investigated, you know, the, all the families that have owned it, they've researched, you know, what were their coats of arms, what were their activities, what were their names, is there some reason why we have a piglet up there? And unfortunately there's no answer. The, the only thing I can suggest is maybe at a time when farm-raised meat was really just for the wealthy and not for the average folks, perhaps it was a symbol of wealth. The most important building in the square, and, and the second oldest, is the building behind me, which is called the Palazzo dei Priori, the Prior's Palace. It was constructed between 1209 and 1257, and uh, it has a very important claim to fame, and that is that it's the oldest and the first building constructed for a city-state in Europe. The architect of the Florence Town Hall, Arnolfo di Cambio, actually stated in his preparatory notes that he intended Florence's Town Hall to be a larger and more grandiose version of the Palazzo dei Priori in Volterra. The, the name, the Prior's Palace, tells us about the title given to the first rulers of the city-states. They were called Priors. Uh, they ruled with an oligarchy, and uh, by no means was this pure democracy, but the city-states really did represent an important first step towards democracy in Europe because it was no longer just the Holy Roman Emperor or the Pope in far-off lands calling the shots. Now there was greater self and local rule. Um, the, the prior and his family actually would live inside the building you see. So it's from where, it's where the town council would meet, it's where governance was, was done, but also it was their private residence. Uh, the prior actually would be sequestered inside the building for the entire duration of his term. So the terms had to be short um, because this was a, a term of sufferance, suffering and uh, it was usually six to twelve months. During that period, the prior was never allowed to leave the building. Of course, he'd have advisors to be his intermediaries with the outside world so he could actually govern. But the, the concern was corruption, bribery, conflict of interest. Of course, 
we've surpassed all of those concerns today. Um, but they kept him inside the building and would never leave him out and w would never let him leave and would never let anyone else in to try to avoid that corruption. But of course, this man is a Christian. I mean, he may not be allied with the Pope, but he's still, of course, a Christian. So how is he to continue his religious life if he can't leave the building? And they're not going to leave the let the priest go up either. Well, the compromise was found by building the Palazzo dei Priori back to back with the cathedral. So the black and white striping that you see is actually the backside of Volterra's cathedral, consecrated in 1120 by Pope Callistus II. And there's a wing of the town hall building on the opposite side that actually goes on top of the cathedral so that from within the prior's quarters, he can open wooden shutters and have a clear view straight down onto the altar of the cathedral. So from there, he could kneel on a pew and attend mass. And many people would say, also keep a very tight control on everything that was being said and done inside the cathedral. Here is the back entrance into the cathedral. You can see with the black and white striping that this is a holy building. And unlike the other yellow stone buildings in the rest of the square, all of which uh, are civic buildings. If the door is open, you're welcome in. Volterra's cathedral was consecrated by Pope Callistus II in 1120. It's built in a, in a very humble version of one of Europe's most magnificent architectural styles, the Pisan Romanesque, which will be one of the mo most important foundation stones to Renaissance architecture. The cathedral that we see today, though, built in, uh, sometime before 1120, uh, is not the first but the third version of a cathedral here in Volterra. Volterra was actually one of the first dioceses in Christianity to ever be established in terms of its geo uh, geographic limits. Um, Voltaire is the birthplace of five popes, and the first of these five popes was quite an influential figure. He was Peter's successor. His name was Linus. Um, not much is known about him, but it's, it's widely believed that he gave Volterra such prominence within the early Christian church, and that would remain for many centuries. On the facade of the cathedral, you can uh, find some interesting details, in including the Carolingian floral motif along the cornices, and also the reuse of pagan Roman stones in the main portal, the main most important entrance into this most important Christian building in town. Uh, in fact, the white marble columns and capitals that you see on this main portal came from Volterra's Roman theater. Already in disuse for hundreds of years, they thought, why not? take these beautiful white stones and use them for the cathedral. But it was also more than that. It was almost as if they were reclaiming their pagan past as something that Christianity had conquered and was building upon. We're here in Piazza San Giovanni, which is the religious square of Volterra. Uh, it holds a baptistry, which is the building uh, behind me. The baptistry of Volterra was built in 1285. It was built in the Pisan Romanesque style, which is the same style uh, used for the Pisa baptistry as well, uh, which was constructed in 1153. Other baptistries in Tuscany will often have this bichrome striping and, and similar styles. It's essential to have a baptistry if you have a cathedral, because wherever you have a seat of a diocese, one bishop, one cathedral, one baptistry. Because in this period, it was very important for their religious beliefs that you enter the cathedral as a Christian. That's the need for a separate building. But also remember that, that Christianity hadn't really been established throughout Europe as the common religion for that many centuries. And so it was all the more important to, to give something monumental for those who were entering into the Christian faith to make it a ceremonious occasion with such a magnificent building. Now the baptistry here in Voltaire is octagonal. Almost all baptistries are octagonal, although some are circular. And this too has significance because both the circle and the figure eight are endless figures. They have no beginning or end point, symbols of the infinity and thus of the eternal life gained through baptism in the Christian faith. Now, the, the fact that we have in this religious square four buildings that marked four important moments in the life of a Christian was no coincidence. Now, in Volterra, like any other Italian town, wherever you have a seat of a diocese, you have cathedral, baptistry, hospital, and cemetery. Now, we no longer have a functioning hospital here, in the, but it moved out in the 1980s. Larger buildings outside of town. And also the cemetery is long gone because they realized that the new Christian practice of burying the dead inside the city walls was not the hottest idea, especially when plague would hit and 
contagion would spread like wildfire. But originally, these four buildings signified the cycle of life, birth with the baptistry, life in the cathedral, difficulty and need in the hospital, and of course, death in the cemetery. Well, that's to remind man of his vanitas, of his vanity. Or more precisely, what they mean is, what are you left with in the end? Because there is an end, because this is the natural cycle of life. In the end, you have bones, you have a soul, but you don't have your possessions. You don't have your appearance. You don't have the power you've been trying to amass. All of those will be in vain, vanitas. And so the corollary is, of course, and what they're after is, care for your soul during your lifetime, because that's what will be of importance in the end. But the conundrum is, artistically, how do you represent the soul? No one has ever come up with a commonly recognized way of representing the human soul. And so what they often will do is show us bones instead, because that's the other thing you're left with. So an example of this, you can actually see on the facade of the uh, little chapel of the Misericordia, where you have a skull and V-shaped wings. They show you the bones to remind you man care for your soul. And the wings, they're in the shape of a V, to represent the V of vanity, of vanitas. The Misericordia, is the Volunteer Ambulance Association. They're volunteers. Uh, the full name is actually Arci Confraternita della Misericordia. So it's a fraternity of compassion. That's a very old fashioned name, um, but understandable considering the, the association first appeared in Tuscany in 1348. That's a year Tuscans will never forget because that's when the Black Death or the bubonic plague ravaged the area, when between five months May to October, in one year, between a half to two-thirds of the people you knew died. Well, the Misericordia are the courageous men, most of them the delivery men of the towns, who volunteered to move the sick and dead outside the city walls, otherwise they feared everyone might die. Well, it's been around ever since, and it's an association that's actually still unique just to Tuscany. Well, Volterra is a town that has many important museums and monuments, but one of the things that I love most about this town is the fact that it, it's filled with lanes and alleys and residential homes and hidden corners. Uh, I, I think it took me several months, actually, to, to discover all of them when I first moved to Volterra, and it's something that, that my friends and family and, and visitors often remark on as well is finding their own favorite secret corner, hidden lane in Volterra, having a glass of wine, watching the sunset and seeing the little old ladies walk by with their shopping bags and the, the mothers with the strollers and those poorly behaved Italian children, probably one of them was my own, wreaking havoc as they run down the lanes. It's, it's real life, it's a community, it's Volterra's heart and soul. So we're in one of the main intersections of Volterra where Via Matteotti and Via Gramsci meet. This is often where Volterans will come and run into their friends and decide to have a cocktail. Now, what are the daily rituals after going to the butcher and the baker and I'm not sure we have a candlestick maker, but you know, getting all your daily provisions. Volterans often come out on the city streets around 6.30, 7 p.m. and have the evening passeggiata. So what that means too is you don't really ever have to make an appointment with your friends to say we'll meet on Thursday evening at 6. You just go out, have your passeggiata, and you'll most likely run into them. It's a wonderful way of keeping the community alive. Also, Volterra has uh, something special about it that even larger towns like Siena don't have, and that's the fact that the numerous bars and cafes in town open from the morning pastries through lunch into the afternoon are also open after dinner. And so many Volterans continue that habit of the passeggiata also after dinner, coming out and you'll see 90-year-old men, 2-year-old children, 30-somethings, 20-year-old singles, all together in the same cafe having a chamomile tea, a glass of wine, a Bacardi breezer, whatever it may be, and the community stays in touch that way. So it's, it's wonderful when you're part of the local community, but it's also wonderful when you're visiting the town as well to be a part of it. So this is Via Matteotti, where some of the Volterans' favorite cafes and restaurants and little shoe stores and various pizza by the slice places are to be found. The locals in Tuscany often have their own names for each street, and the local name for this is Via Guidi. Because if you look at a map, you'll see one name, but if you ask a local for directions, you'll be told another. <laughs> so what they often do is you'll have the big sign with the proper map name that's on the map, and then underneath it, a little sign that says Gia, which means previously known as what everybody's actually calling it. 
Volterra's population is officially 12,000 people. Now that is, it's a very big town area, so it includes a, a large uh, rural area. But about half of the population lives inside the city walls, which today have a perimeter of about four kilometers or 2.5 miles, and half live outside the city walls. But most of the people who live outside the city walls and in many other towns and villages gather in Volterra and use it for their services, their shopping. And Volterra actually is a hub for many services and also for education. We have six high schools in Volterra, serving not just the 12,000 people within uh, the jurisdiction of Volterra, but also many other areas, towns in the rural area. The seasons in which Volterra is most not crowded, but most visited, let's say, is our spring and summer, without a doubt. So from April through to June, June is a particularly busy month, end of May, June, the summer months actually are not that busy at all. Uh, July, August, um, you'll have a lot of Italians traveling and visiting, but not so many foreign visitors. And then September, October, it actually is quite busy again. And things will start to get slower again in November, though personally, my favorite time to be here is November. Um, not only do you, is the town filled with local folk, and, and that's enough to keep the town vibrant, but also you chestnuts are being harvested, the new wine is being produced, the olives are picked and pressed at the community presses into new oil, truffles are, and wild mushrooms are being found. If, if someone were to ask me when do you get Volterra at its most real and best, I'd say November. At the moment, in this damp November day. I don't see any foreigners except ourselves. <laughs> this is Volterra's Roman theater. It was constructed in the second half of the first century BC, dedicated to the reigning Emperor Augustus. And it's important also to note that we're not looking at an amphitheater, but a theater. Now, uh, today we use amphitheater a lot for outdoor arenas, but in ancient Rome there were theaters and there were amphitheaters, and they were different things. A theater was always a half circle, a theater was always used for plays, and the theater was the most common form and place of entertainment throughout the Roman Republic. Only in the first century AD will you start to see amphitheaters, ambitheaters, doubled theaters. So the form is different now. It's a circle, or more commonly even an oval, and it's used for lots of different types of entertainment, but mostly blood and guts entertainment. Uh, it, it will come to pass that people will think, why would you want to go see a boring Roman readaptation of a Greek tragedy? when you could go watch a guy bash another guy's brains in. Mm -hmm. um, and so theaters will get abandoned. That's why it's so rare uh, and so special to have this theater still remaining here in Volterra. Now the theater had a seating capacity of about 2,500 spectators. The wealthy, the noble, the patricians sat closer down to the stage. The, the average Joes farther up, uh, just like today, I suppose. When, when you get to the bottom of the sloped half circle, there is a, a flat half circle. And that was called the orchestra section. That's where the guests of honor would sit, so people like the Emperor Augustus. Augustus seems to have liked this theater of Valle Bona here in Volterra, uh, considering its acoustics to be the best in the empire and also one of the most beautiful theaters uh, as well. This theater is also remarkable because it was the second ever Roman theater built in stone. It's not out of a lack of resources or, or interest, but it's, it's actually it's against the law in ancient Rome to build stone theaters. Uh, the Senate passed a law saying, we welcome donations and we recognize that patrician families are, are almost always donating theaters to their city. But we don't want them making grandiose, permanent constructions as donations. So theaters, yes, continue donating them, please, but make them wooden, temporary structures. And so it would be for centuries until they find a loophole. And that loophole is to point to another Roman law that says wherever you have a temple dedicated to Rome's Capitoline triad, you have to have stone stairs leading to that temple to correctly honor and distinguish those the most important gods of Rome. So what they do is at the top of the cavia of the seating section they put in three semicircular niches. Into those niches went a white marble statue of Juno, one of Jove and one of Minerva and there you have your temple. Well, what lay beneath aren't stone bleacher seats for the theater. No, 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 they're stairs leading to the temple. They're doing their duty as good Roman citizens honoring their gods.
Well, when they get away with it in Volterra, that's when the rest of the empire will realize they too can do it. And so after this, you will see a flood of construction of Roman theaters in stone. Um, on the back side of the theater are Volterra's third set of public baths. Mm. Now, they were built probably at the end of the third century AD, but they never used them at the same time. And we know that because the baths are constructed taking stones away from the theater. So for whatever mm. reason, they had already abandoned the theater. Mm -hmm. um, what we see, of course, are, are just the foundations of what were originally sumptuous rooms with mosaic floors and uh, mm -hmm. probably marble inlay on the interior walls. Moving from the theater back towards the road would have been first the vestibulum, the changing room followed by the frigidarium with cold water, then mm -hmm. the very small little oval tepidarium with warm water, then the caldarium with the hot water, and then off to the right, a circular structure called the laconicum. Now, it was a sauna, and it was so hot in there, of course, you couldn't help but laconically lounge and uh, enjoy this spa-like experience. Now, mm -hmm. the Roman baths were so important to Roman culture. It was actually your right as a Roman citizen to access them. Um, this is a great service to keeping people happy and healthy, but also, I think it's important to remember, loyal because this is what your state provides for you. Anyone except a slave could go to these places, do exercises in the grassy outdoor area, jump into the cold, the warm, the hot water baths, um, and also hydrate the skin with olive oil that would be provided free of charge and scrub clean with pumice sand. It's something that I think many people would like to have as a right today, myself included. <laughs> so after the fall of the Roman Empire, uh, it'll take a few hundred years of disuse in this area uh, and people will start to uh, realize no one's going to fix it up again. So they start to use it as a salvage yard. They'll take the columns, the capitals to build the cathedral and many other buildings in town. Uh, and then in the 13th century, New walls are built to surround and protect Volterra. It's a time of great fear, uncertainty. So the walls are actually made tighter and, and, and around Volterra, making the city smaller. Um, those are the walls that we see above the theater today. So, so with the creation of these walls in the 13th century, um, the theater and baths were no longer in city center. The town then decides, well, isn't this a convenient place to have all the local people dump their garbage? Instead of dumping your buckets of waste in the city streets, please take them and dump them over the wall. So garbage piled up on top of the theater and baths. A hill formed. By the 1800s, it was pretty clear that no one remembered ancient ruins being beneath the hill. By the 1900s, it was also being used as a soccer field, when we're using it as a donkey racetrack. And only in 1950, after World War II, did a local intellectual get a hunch that the theater may have been here. Uh, he will succeed in convincing the Italian state to give him a permit to do the dig, but he can't convince them to give him financing, not in these post-war years. So he gets creative and finds a group of volunteers. They did a massive operation of land movement and they did their job technically very well. That may be a surprise if you know that they were not archaeologists. Not even the man behind the dig, Enrico Fiumi, was an archaeologist. He was very good at it, but he made a living by managing the finances of Volterra's psychiatric institute. It was a 6,000 patient large psychiatric institute, the second largest poll for Italy's mentally ill, and that's where he found his volunteers. <laughs> so we had psychiatric patients for 10 years excavate everything that we see today. And uh, a happy side of the story is that most of the men involved in the dig were actually deemed healed throughout the process and freed from institutional life. Um, though I'm told that every single one of them, to a man, stayed on to see the completion of the dig. <laughs> I, well, you know, I could go on and on. <laughs> but <laughs> we... uh, my name is Annie Adair. I am now an Italian citizen, as well as an American citizen. Um, I've been living in Volterra for 14 years, uh, though I originally hail from Washington, D.C. Um, I, I fell in love with Volterra quite unexpectedly, traveling here after graduating from college. Um, and Volterra helped me realize all that history could be uh, and how much it was is really essentially a, a, a continuum of so many human lives. So I find um, a lot of, now that I work as a tour guide, a lot of my clients who love history often fall for Volterra, like I did 14 years ago. 
My website is www.tuscantour.com. No S's in there, all singular. We have many more movies in our travel collection covering Europe, the Americas, Asia, and other parts of the world.